Amen. If you have your Bible with you, will you please go with me to the book of Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33, we will, we're still um, on the topic of worship. This is another type of worship. Last week we talked about worship as it is in heaven. Um, the type of worship that is taking place in heaven, that is something that we need to adopt here while we are still in this world. Uh, but tonight we're going to talk about uh, the worship, the, the pattern of worship in the Old Testament that some people think that we have to get, to, you know, get rid of that because it's the law, it's the Old Testament. But I want to bring it to you tonight because it's still important to follow that um, to that extent that, that Jesus came and revealed it to us. And we still need to do that every now and again. Uh, because we are still in this world. So if you please can go with me to the book of Exodus chapter 33. We will begin from verse 7 and I will take you through the tabernacle and all the equipments in the tabernacle because it's important for us to understand the, the way in which we have to approach the presence of God. Amen. And how we have to deal with the presence, how we have to, to stay in the presence or dwell in the presence. Amen. So Exodus 33, we will begin from verse number 7. It says in verse 7, um, Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. Now the tabernacle in the Old Testament, according to what we have just read, it is the tabernacle of meeting, according to what the Bible says here. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp. Far from the camp. Okay, there's a reason why the Bible says that, that the, the tabernacle was pitched far from the camp. There must be a separation because that's where the presence of God will come. We will, we will go down and then you will find out that when Moses went into the tabernacle or the tent of meeting, the presence of God came down to him and talked with him. Moses conversed with God in the tabernacle, just as I'm doing to you now. Okay, but there's a reason because the people in back, back in those days, the people, they don't go into the temple of, you know, the tabernacle of meeting or the tent of meeting to worship God. They just stand, they just stay within that tent and they just watch Moses as he went in. And they can see the cloud visibly. They can see the cloud that came down from heaven into the tabernacle of worship or the tent of worship. The reason why there's a separation because of the people, they still live in sin. Only the priest is allowed to go in the tabernacle. Okay, at this stage, there wasn't any tabernacle. It was just Moses' tent. After that, then, Moses, then God gave Moses the plan of how to construct a tabernacle. And all the, the equipment that, that needs to be placed in and within and without the tabernacle. So that's the reason why it says there that it was, um, he erected the tent, he pitched the tent far from the camp and called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people, okay, it says in verse um, 8, that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. Okay, why is it important? The reason why God came down because Moses make the effort to move out and pitch a tent. He made the, mo he made the, the effort to go, to leave his dwelling place, to leave his family, and to go further along just for him to meet with God. And because God was watching him and what he did. God respect the effort that was made by Moses and God came down. Okay, that's why I said it's important for you to make time for God. Even in your busy schedule, try and make time for God because God respects you 
when you make time for him. And he will come down to where you are to meet with you, to bless you, to encourage you, to strengthen you. Amen. So it's important to make time for God. Even if you are really, really busy, just try and set aside a time for God because God respects people who make time for Him. Amen. This is a clear example of what, what happens. And then, then in verse 10, verse 9, And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. Verse 10, all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped each man in his tent door. They just worship in their tent door. They are not allowed to come. All they can do is stand out, stand outside their tent and look. As soon as they saw the, the, the pillar of cloud that descended from heaven, then they knew that God is present there. God is in their midst. That's when they begin to kneel and worship God at the tent, at the door of their tent. Okay? Verse 11, So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. So now, clearly, Moses took someone with him, the one that will take over from his duty, Moses, uh, Joshua. But you see, the most important part in this, the reason why all this happened is because of what God said to Moses in verse 14. Listen to what God said to Moses. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now that is the bottom line. That's the reason why Moses was willing to separate himself from the people, was willing to walk at a distance, was willing to pitch a tent over there all by himself and call it the tabernacle of meeting, call it the tabernacle of worship. That is the reason why. Amen. That is the reason why. Because he needed the presence of God to go with him. And sure enough, God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. What is the motive of your worship? Now, what is the motive of your worship now? Is it because you need an open door of career? Is it because you need God to meet your needs, your financial needs? Is it because you need God to meet your physical needs? Is it because you need to go, God to meet your health needs? What is the case, beloved? What is the motive? What is the purpose of your worship? We see in here, we, what we saw in here is that the Moses, Moses worshiped God because he wants the presence of God to go with him. And sure enough, God said, not only that, he came down, he dwelt in the tent that Moses pitched. And also, he said to Moses, I, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Amen. That, that's, that's all we need. In, in the time that we are living in now. This is all we need. We just need the presence of God. Amen. Even if we don't have things, the materialistic things of this world, as long as we have God, that's all that matters, beloved. That's all that, that settles the case for us. Knowing that God is with us, that's all we need. We don't need everything that the world has. We don't need all the You know, people who have all that the world can give, can give them, they are still searching for peace because that is something that money cannot buy. They are still searching for that. And here we see that God said to Moses, I will go with you. My presence will go with you. You know, before that, before that, God said to Moses, verse 2, chapter 33 of Exodus, verse 2. Listen to what God said to Moses. And I will send my angel before you. My angel, I will send my angel. Meaning, Moses, I'm not going to go with you. My angel will come with you. And then Moses said, Moses said to them, you know, if, if your presence are not coming with us, we are not going. 
I don't want your angel. I want you. He said in verse 2, And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, and the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now therefore, take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. Okay, so by what God said to him, then Moses did what he needs to do. Okay, but I want to take you to the tabernacle of meeting. The reason why it's important for us to follow that type of worship. Now in the tabernacle, the tabernacle, it consists of an outer court. And then we have the holies of holies, the holy place, sorry. And then the holies of holies. So we have the outer court. Number one, outer court, and then the holy of holies, the holy place, number two, and the holy of holies, number three. Okay, but that is just in general the layout of the tabernacle. But there are equipments all along as you enter into the gate, coming into the outer court, the first thing that you will notice or you will see is the brazen altar. Okay, now the brazen altar, this is a place where... Uh, there are so many offerings that is, that is done in the brazen altar. It's the sin offering, the trespass offering, the burnt offering, the thanks offering, and the reconciliation offering. It all happens at the brazen altar. And in the time that we are living in now, that represents the cross of Jesus Christ. Okay? The cross of Jesus Christ. That's where the priest will come. They will bring all the, the animals that need to be sacrificed. They will sacrifice that in the outer court. In the brazen altar. Okay. So when we come to worship God. Now we come to God and we confess our sin before God. Okay. We confess our sins before God. We thank God for the cross. We thank God for the blood of Jesus. The blood that sets us free. The blood that gives us a new identity. The blood that washes us clean from all filthiness, all wickedness, all unrighteousness. This is where we begin our worship. We begin by um, confessing our sins before God. That's where the brazen altar is. That's where we, we bring all our sacrifices. We bring all our sin offerings and we sacrifice it in the brazen altar. After that, the priest will move forward. Now this is something that, that the priest always does um, at the brazen altar. When the sacrifice was brought into that brazen altar then the priest will take the blood of that animal that has been sacrificed. The four corners of that brazen altar has horns. So he will um, pour some blood on the four horns, on the four corners of the brazen altar. And at the foot of that brazen altar, he will pour some blood on that. Amen. So every step for, right from outside, the blood is spilled right into the holies of holies. Okay, right into the mercy seat. The blood will make its way right from the brazen altar right into the holies of holies. Amen. That shows the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. The sacrifice that he did on the cross. He gave his life. He shed his blood. And by his blood, we are cleansed. We are saved, we are set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. So that's where they will um, come and sacrifice all the animals according to the Levitical law, according to all that God has said. The type of animals that people have to bring into the tabernacle of worship. Okay, So that's where they will bring all that. The priest his job is to sacrifice all those animals. The priest is the one that will call out to God on behalf of the whole nation. 
He is the only one that is allowed to go into the holies of holies. No one is allowed to go in there. But thank God for Jesus Christ, who's the, one he, he, the one who died on the cross. He makes it possible for each and every one of us, including you and me, for us to go into the holies of holies and we can call out our Father into our Heavenly Father. Amen. You now have the privilege to go right in the tabernacle into the holies of holies. Make use of that privilege, please. You have the privilege to go right into the holies of holies. Make use of that privilege. In the Old Testament, they are not allowed to go in. Now in the New Testament, we are allowed to go in. We go right into the holies of holies. Make use of it. Amen. They longed to go in there, but they are not allowed. We are allowed to go in there, but we don't want to make the effort to go in. That's the difference. People in the Old Testament, they long to go right into the holies of holies. They want to witness, they want to experience the presence of God inside the holies of holies. But they are not allowed to go in. You and I, however, we have the privilege. We are allowed, we are free to go in anytime. But the problem is, we are too lazy to go into the holies of holies. We are too lazy to make the effort. We don't feel like doing it. We feel tired to go in. We say, Lord, I will only go in if I feel like going in. I don't feel like praying today. I don't feel like reading the Bible today. I just want to enjoy my life. Just leave me alone. We have the privilege to go into the holies of holies, my friend. Make the most of it. Please. Go into the, the holies of holies because you are afraid to do it. So the first thing is the brazen altar. Amen. The brazen altar is where we now we approach the brazen altar in confidence. We approach the cross of Jesus Christ with confidence in saying, I believe that the cross of Jesus Christ has saved my life. I believe that the blood of Jesus has set me free. Amen. That's what we have to do. We say to Jesus, you hung on the cross and took my infirmities. This is the place. This is where we thank Jesus for dying on the cross for us at the brazen altar. After that, then we will see the laver. Okay, the laver is a brass bowl just beside, just before you enter the holy place. Now, it is so shiny that you can use it as a mirror. Okay, we'll say that again. This brass, the, the laver, the brass bowl is so shiny that you can use it as a mirror. But there's another thing, it contains water in it. So the priest, after doing the sacrifice at the brazen altar, this is where he will wash his hand and he will wash his feet before entering the holy place. Okay? Now, listen to what I said there. The, the laver, it acts as two things. Number one, two things. Number one, acts as a mirror because it's so shiny, the brush is so shiny that you can even see yourself through it, by it. And then it contains water, which is clean water for you, for the priest to wash his hand and his feet. So this is the thing. After we reach the brazen altar where we confess our sin, thank God for Jesus Christ, thank Jesus for the cross, thank Jesus for the blood, by His stripes we are healed. That's where we thank God, that's where we adore Him, and that's where we ask for His forgiveness. But then we step over to the labor where you will wash your hands spiritually and you will wash your feet spiritually. But how about the mirror? Where can you, what can you do with the mirror? Now, the mirror is the Old Testament, is the, the, the Ten Commandments. Okay. Right now as we speak, the Ten Commandments is there as a mirror. It's not our master anymore. It's just our mirror. Okay, I will say that again. The Ten Commandments no longer is no longer our master. We are not judged by the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is just our mirror. It's not our master anymore. It used to be before Jesus Christ. Okay? Now what does it mean? What does it mean to 
use it as a mirror. Do you remember the Ten Commandments? Okay, so when you come to the liver, that's where you will wash your hands. You will wash your face. That's where you will look into the mirror and reflect to the Ten Commandments and started asking God the question. You can say, Lord, like what David says. David said, search me, O God, and know my heart today. That's what David says in the book of Psalms. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart today. So what we do when we come to the labor, we stand at the labor, and this is what we say, Lord, expose any sin in me. I give my life to you, Lord Jesus. You expose any sin in me. Whatever things that you know that is not according to your word, that is not according to your way, please expose this in me. Okay? And then we reflect to the Ten Commandments. You can do this every morning when you pray. Okay? You can do this every morning when you pray. You reflect on the Ten Commandments. Commandment number one, you shall have no gods before me. So you ask the Lord, do I worship other gods? If I do, forgive me for dishonoring you by entertaining other gods. Amen. Commandment number two. Lord, your word says you shall make no idols. Do I make idols? Do I bow down to my career? Do I bow down to my car? Do I bow down to my house? Do I bow down to mater the materialistic things of this world? If I do, please, Lord, please forgive me for dishonoring you by worshiping idols. Whatever you put in front, in place of God, that is your idol. Okay? God will always, God must take the first place in your life. God must be your priority. If you take something else as your priority and God is second in your life, then whatever thing it is, it will be your idol. So you've got to check in the mirror whether you are serving idols or you are serving God. Wash your hands. Wash your face at the labor. Third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So go back to the labor. Lord, do I take your name in vain? Do I call out your name in vain? Do I say your name in vain? If I do, please forgive me for dishonoring you by calling out your name in vain. Move on to the next commandment. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Lord, do I... Keep the commandment regarding the Sabbath. Do I keep it holy? Forgive me for dishonoring you by not keeping the Sabbath commandment. And then go to the next one. Honor your father and your mother. And say, God, do I, do I honor my parents or do I blame them for the problem that I am in right now? Do I honor those who are leading my, 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 my spiritual life? Do I honor people who, have you, who, who you have set in, um, above me to lead me? Do I honor them or do I dishonor them? If that is the case, if that's you, then you've got to change that now. Because we are looking into that mirror. Amen? Number, four, number six, you shall not murder. Check your life. Ask God to reveal things in your life. Maybe you hate somebody. According to what Jesus says, He said, you have heard what the law says, thou shalt not commit murder. But I tell you, if you hate somebody, you have already committed murder within you. That's when you stand at the lever, now worshiping God and asking Him, check me, O God, expose any sin in me, whether I hate somebody, whether I hate the people that I live with, whether I hate the people that I work with. Maybe I hate my siblings or I hate my husband, hate my wife. Whoever it may be, if you hate somebody, beloved, you are committing murder in your heart. That's where you need to come at the labor and check yourself in the mirror and wash your hands and wash your face before you go into the holies of holies. Remember, forget about the presence of God. You've got to go through this. You've got to check. You've got to allow the Holy Spirit to expose sin in you. Otherwise, the presence won't go with you. You see, Moses did all that he needs to do. The bottom line is he wants the presence to go with him. And sure enough, God says, you know what? My presence will go with you, Moses. And I will give you rest. Amen. What more can we ask for? 
when God says to you and me, my presence will go with you. I don't care what the people say about you. As long as you do what I want you to do, my presence will go with you. Don't worry about what the people say. Don't worry about what they think. As long as the presence of God is going with you, beloved, that's all that matters. That's all we need. We just need the presence of God. But you've got to go through the process. Amen? You've got to go through the process. Don't hate the people. Because in doing so, you are committing murder in your heart. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. You've got to ask God, Lord, please expose this sin in me. Do I commit adultery or do I entertain lustful thoughts? If I do, then please forgive me for dishonoring you by being sexually impure. You've got to ask God to forgive you. You've got to ask God to expose that in you. If we want to hide it, beloved, we can hide it from the people, but we cannot hide it from God. There will always come a time when the Holy Spirit will expose things in your life. So you've got to remember, the presence is what we need. If this is what we need to do, if it, this is what it takes to get the presence, then so be it. Amen? We need the presence. What, in our service, we need the presence of God. If in Nakadake, it is good to have the presence of God than the presence of thousands or millions of people in one service. The presence of God is much more important, is, much, is what we needed most in this life, in this time. We just need the presence of God. And he even said it, two or three are gathered in my name. My presence will be there. Amen. Not 2,000 or 3,000, not 2 million or 3 million. Just two or three. God will be there. Jesus, I am in their midst. Amen. So you've got to ask God to expose all this in you. This, we are just talking about the labor here. Okay, and number eight, you shall not steal. You know, sometimes we are working, wherever we are working, we take something, you know, thinking oh, it's, not, it's nothing, not, not a big deal. I, I work here, so I can just take it without paying for it. I can just, you know, another way of robbing the people, I will, I will tell you, is when you are paid for your job, eight to five, and you sneak out at four. And you sign in, sign off for five o'clock. Okay? Does that make sense? You were meant to finish at five. You finish early. You turn up late. You finish early. But you sign off by five o'clock. For five o'clock. That's another way of robbing your boss. Robbing your company. Okay? I'm not sure about the military. How does that work? Because we are told that we are paid 24-7. Then we are paid 24-7. Okay? But to those of us who are working outside in civilian companies, you know, you are working uh, on the hours that you are paid for. Okay? You work on the hours that you are paid for. So please don't rob your boss by turning up late. When you turn up late, you are robbing the company. Okay? And I can guarantee you, if they miscalculate your wages for a month you will be on that phone call whoever is dealing with your payroll and ask them how come my wages is deducted we are so quick in judging them and deducting our wages but we turn up late that's one way we are robbing the people we are stealing you see, out of all the things that God can do, that God can put in the Ten Commandments to be one of the most important ten, He then put, do not steal. There are so many sins that He can come up with and put it there, but He just picked the one that is really important. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. So these are the top ten in the world. Okay, God didn't just, didn't make a mistake. God never make a mistake. He puts it there for a reason because sometimes we think that people who steal are those who break in a shop. You know, the the greatest robbery that is happening now in the world is done by Christians. 
Okay? Thou shalt not steal. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You've got to ask the question, Lord, am I bearing false witness? Am I witnessing falsely? If I do, then please forgive me for dishonoring you by not by doing that. Okay? And lastly, you shall not covet. Covetousness. Okay, there are so many other things, but God just put covetousness because that is the root, that is the top. Underneath covetousness then comes all other things, but they are all connected to covetousness. That's why God puts it at, as one of the top ten sin that we shouldn't do. Okay? Now, that's at the labor. You wash your hands, you wash your face, you confess your sin, you ask God to expose sin in you, ask the Holy Spirit to expose sin in you. Once you've done that, then you enter the holy place. In the holy place, there are three equipment in the holy place. So we've done two. The brazen altar, which is at the outer court, and then the laver, where you wash your hands, and now your hands are clean, your face are clean, your feet are clean. You are eligible now to enter the holy place. You draw the curtains and you enter the holy place. Once you're in the holy place, the first thing on your left is the seven lamp stand, which represents the Holy Spirit, the seven spirit of God. Okay, There is no light in the holy place. The seven candlestick lampstand is the only light that illuminates the holy place. When you enter that place, you know, sometimes we come into our worship, there are so many Christians, they just enter the courtyard and they remain in the courtyard until they go back home. Okay? When we come into our worship, when you go into a gathering, make sure that you enter the courtyard you sacrifice, you thank God for the blood, thank God for the cross. You move forward in confessing your sin, exposing the sin that is in you. And then you move forward meeting the Holy Spirit. And then you go into the table of sobread, meaning you listen to the word of God. And then you go into the table of incense, which represents the prayer of the saints. And then you go into the Holy of Holies, where you will meet with God. Amen. Make sure next time you go into a worship service, don't just remain in the outer court. Make the effort to go right into the holies of holies. Because sometimes people just go and enter the outer court and they just mingle around the outer court until they went back home. They didn't get to see and feel the presence of God. Not because it's not there, but because they just don't make the effort to go right in. So please, for you and for me, next time we come together into a church gathering, into a service, a worship service, try and go right into the Holies of Holies. Because I guarantee you, you will never be the same again. There will be a different feeling altogether that you will experience right into the Holies of Holies. Okay? So now, the seven spirits. Let's go to the, the, the seven lamp stem, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of wisdom, number two, the spirit of counsel, number three, the spirit of knowledge, number four, the spirit of might, number five, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, number six, and the spirit of holiness, number seven. That's in the Holy of Holies. Amen. That is what we need. We need to have a close, intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to give us understanding. We need the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom. We need the Holy Spirit to counsel us so that we know what to do. We need the spirit of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. We need the spirit of might to live a holy life. We need the spirit of the fear of the Lord so that we know what to do and how we've got to live our lives. We have to be governed by the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Always fear the Lord in whatever you do. And lastly, the spirit of holiness. Because the Bible says, be holy, First Peter, be holy for he who calls you is holy. Leviticus 19, 
It says that. Leviticus 11, 44, 45, it says that as well. Be holy for I am your God. I am holy. We need that. As we come into the presence of God, led by the Spirit of the living God, on the right, we will see the table of so bread, which represents the logos, which is the written word, and the rima, which is the inspired word of God. Amen? The inspired word of God. Now, I want to show you one thing. The, the difference, okay? The difference. The difference between the logos and the rima, and how effective are they, right? You know, remember, do you remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? You know, the Bible says that after he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. I will say that again. The Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, the Holy Spirit didn't tempt him. The Holy Spirit led him to be tempted by the devil. The devil is the one that makes the temptation. Okay, that tempt Jesus. But the Holy Spirit led him there. And you remember when they were exchanging words, the devil tries to bribe Jesus by saying to him, if you bow down to me, I will give you the whole world. He's, he's trying to give to Jesus the very thing that Jesus created in the beginning. Because in the beginning, Jesus was there with God. So they were there during the creation. They created the world. And then Satan says, oh, if you bow down to me, I will give you this. He's trying to give Jesus the very thing that Jesus created. How silly was him? Okay. How stupid is that? To try and bribe Jesus with the world that Jesus created. And Jesus' response was this. It is written. And then he tried another tactics. He says, if you just fall down from this place. You know, the Bible says it is written. The devil said this. It is written that angels... He quoted Moses' psalm. You know, Psalms 91 was written by Moses. It was composed by David, but written by Moses. Moses wrote Psalms 91. Just in case you don't know, that's something new for you today. Moses wrote Psalms 91. When Moses says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, he knew what he was talking about. He dwelled in the presence on top of the mountain, Mount Sinai, 40 days and 40 nights. He came down with his, uh, his face shining. So Moses knew what he was writing down. He knew what he wrote. He knew. He knew it by experience. He didn't just say things that he heard from somebody. He experienced that. He was there for 40 days and 40 nights. So the devil quoted Moses' Psalms, Psalms 91. He said, well, the angels will carry you so that you, you may not dash your foot against a rock. And every time the devil said that, Jesus said, it is written. It is written. The devil says, it is written. Jesus said, it is written. Now, what are they doing? They are exchanging the logos. The, the devil uses the logos, the written word. Jesus uses the logos because they both say it is written. But one thing Jesus mentioned that was not written in the Bible. Okay. While he was saying all that he needs to say, then Jesus said this. Get thee behind me, Satan. Now that is the rima. That is just mentioned right there and then at that moment. That is not part of the written word. Okay, no one from the beginning, from Genesis to Malachi, no one wrote that. Satan, get thee behind me. No one wrote that. Okay, all that they were talking about is what was written by the prophets divinely inspired by God that drives them to write all those words and those are the words that they exchange with the devil and Jesus the devil and Jesus it is written it is written it is written it is written and then Jesus comes up with a rima get thee behind me Satan and he left now that's the difference between the rima and the logos it's good to spend time on the logos because once you spend time on the Logos, 
the rima will be given to you. The table of so bread. You've gone past the lampstand. You've gone past the seven spirits of God according to Isaiah 11 and Revelation 4 and 5. Then you come to the table of so bread where you will have to study the logos, read the logos, spend time on the logos in order for you to receive the rima. Forget about the rima if you don't spend time on the logos. It will never work. You see on the table of so bread, on one side six loaves of bread represents the six tribes and on the other one another six loaves that represents another six tribes. So there are twelve loaves of bread on the table of so bread. So there are two sides of it. You've got to spend time on the logos in order to receive the rima. You've got to spend time on God. You've got to read the logos. You've got to study the logos and then with the divine inspiration from the Holy Spirit who will drop the rima into your heart and that's what makes you different. That's what makes you stand out from everybody because you've got a rima word from God for the people and that's what we need. Amen. So that's the table of so bread. I will go into details on this, all, all the equipments in the future but as of now we are just rushing through it so that you know a rough idea of what the tabernacle is all about. We will go into the robe of the priest and why is it so significant to us now. Okay, now after the table of so bread, then we come into the, the, the tabernacle, um, the incense, the table of incense. Okay, that's where we will sacrifice all the, the, the we sacrifice the fragrance, that's the word. Okay, that's where they, they burn the, the incense, the incense, that, that the, the fragrance from that incense will fill the whole holy place before the priest enter the holies of holies. Okay, in our worship that represents our prayers, the prayers of the saints. Okay, our prayers. So these are intertwined between each other. The Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of the word of the, the, the Lord, and then the the logos and the rima and our prayer. They all work together in order for the priest to enter right into the holies of holies. So you as the priest of your own life, we are all royal priesthood. Now you are the priest of your life. So this is something that you need to do. You've got to be led by the seven spirits of the living God. And then they will transfer you to the logo. The Holy Spirit will drive you to open your Bible. The Holy Spirit will drive you to read the, the logos. And from there he will speak the rima to you. And the Holy Spirit will drive you to your knees so that you pray to God. Once you do all those by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, then you will go into the holies of holies. That's where you will dwell longer than normal. It will be a very different atmosphere in the holies of holies. But you've got to go through all that. Amen. Now that's our worship. So the question is, can we go through all that in one worship? It depends on how well you prepare your heart. If you come prepared, sure enough, you will reach the holies of holies. If you just come because you just want to waste time, because you just want to you know, make, make it look good to the people, you just want to please your wife or you just want to please your husband, you just come to church for the sake of coming to church, then you will be mingling around the outer court and you go back home. You'll never take anything with you. Please, when you come, don't just mingle outside the outer court. Go past the outer court, go through the laver, wash yourself, enter the holies of holies, be led by the Spirit into the Word, into prayer, and then right into the holies of holies. The, whole, the last equipment is, already, is both in the um, holies of holies. That is the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat, which is on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? Inside the Ark of the Covenant, there are three things in there. A pot of manna, Okay, um, the Ten Commandments and Aaron's staff. Those are the only three things in there. It has its meaning. We'll go through that one day. 
Okay? But please, remember, at the mercy seat, that's where the priest will bow down, he will go down, and then he will move forward, pour the blood, sprinkle the blood on top of the mercy seat, and then move backwards. The, the priest will never turn his back against the mercy seat. It is so holy, the, spirit, the, the priest is not allowed to turn his back and move back. He just have to walk in, sprinkle the blood, and walk back out, facing the mercy seat, facing the Ark of the Covenant. That's the Holy of Holies. That's where you will just meet with God. God said to Moses, when he gave him the plan, he said, In between the wings of the cherubim, there I will meet with you. The meeting place is right inside, not in the outer court, not at the brazen altar, not at the laver, not in the holies of holies. The meeting place is right in the middle of the holies of holies. That is the meeting place. Amen. So it is, our, it is in our best interest. When we come into a service like that, make sure that you go right into the Holies of Holies. You will not take anybody with you. That's an individual effort that makes you or allows you to go right into the Holies of Holies. Make sure you do that. Don't just come for the sake of coming to church. When you come to church, make sure I'm going to church now and I will meet with my God. When you make that effort, when you make that determination in your heart to meet God, God will surely meet with you. Moses did exactly the same. Amen. He did exactly the same. And sure enough, God said to him, Do you know what? My presence will go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. That's what we need in the time that we are living in. We just need the presence of God. Okay. So today we talk about the brazen altar. We talk about the laver, we talk about the seven lampstand, we talk about the table of soap bread, we talk about the um, altar of incense, and then the two equipment in the holies of holies, which is the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. Okay, so that's how we've got to worship God now. Just come, adore Him, exalt Him, thank Him for the cross, Thank Him for sending His Son, Jesus Christ, and thank Jesus for dying on the cross. Thank Him for His blood. And then you go in, and then you expose, ask God to expose sin in you, to reveal to you where you have gone wrong, at the laver, where you will wash your hands and wash your face and wash your feet. And then you enter into the holies of holies, the holy place, where the Holy Spirit will lead you. And then you go into the time where you will hear the Word of God. And then you will go and pray at the altar of incense where prayer is offered up as a fragrant inside the, the holy place. It fills the whole place. And then you go right into the holies of holies where you will meet with God. Amen. Don't just come to church to see other people. Don't just come to church to use the two hours that you have for free. Okay, the, the, the free hours that you have, don't use it to come to church. Please, come to church because you want to meet God. Come to church because you want to hear something from God. Come to church because you want to have that close, intimate relationship with God. Amen. 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 You've got to feel that. You've got to experience the close relationship with Jesus. You've got to experience His presence. That's when, when that happens, it, it, it worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it to come to church. Amen. When that happens. So please, make sure, make sure. Amen. Make sure you come to church, come prepared. Arms open wide for God. Hearts open wide for God. And say to Him, Lord, you know what? Expose things in my life that is not according to your word. And please teach me and, and guide me. Holy Spirit, I'm here for you. Do whatever you want in order to change this life. Amen. Let that be your prayer. When you come into the presence of God, Holy Spirit, change me. Help me. 
deliver me. You know, he's more than willing to do that and he's happy to do that for you. Amen. Don't just, I will use a word. It's, it's a little bit too much. Don't, don't waste time coming to church. Come to church to mean business with God. Come to church to meet God. Because the same God that you will worship now is the same God that you will worship then when you come into the kingdom of God. That's if you come into the kingdom of God. That's why it's important to worship God now the way God wants you to worship Him. Because one day, this is the only thing that is done here that will be done in heaven. Worship. Nothing else. In heaven, their lyrics of their worship song, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Nothing else. Just holy, 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 holy. If that's the lyrics of their worship in heaven, then we've got to live as it is in heaven. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Worship God on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Don't just come for the sake of coming to church. Come to church because you mean business with God. Not forsaking the gathering together of believers, but you mean business with Him. Remember, it will be worth it all when you stand before God. It will be worth it all when you stand before God. Remember that. Amen. One day you will stand before God and you will say, I thank God for the word that I've been taught. I thank God for his servant who is telling me the truth about worship. Amen. One day you will, you will stand before God and you will thank him for his blessings on you. He blesses you with his words. Amen. Encourages you to worship like no other. Amen. God bless you. Please close your eyes, bow your heads and let us pray. Father, we thank you once again. We cannot say that we are okay. We will say that we are in need of your help. We need your presence. We need your Holy Spirit. There are so many things that we have done that contradicts your word. We take worshipping you for granted. And Father, we come to you now. Holy Spirit, once again, we thank you. We ask you, please forgive us and help us, empower us and strengthen us so that we worship the, 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 the Lord the way he wants us to worship him. If there are things that we have, um, we have done that, that contradicts your word, the way that we lived our life, there are things that we still treasure, there are, still, there are things that we still prioritize before God. We come before you asking you for your forgiveness. Please help us. We need help. We really do need help from you today. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you for this time. Thank you for the privilege that you have given us to come and sit down in this place just to listen to your word. We will never forget to give you the praises and the glory and the honor. Lord, I pray for your children who have given their time tonight. Lord, bless them and bless those who will listen to this sermon later on. I pray for your blessings upon their lives as well. Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this time. Holy Spirit, once again, we give you the glory and the praises. We exalt you. We acknowledge you. We adore you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for this life. Thank you for the life that is to come that you are preparing us for in the time that we are living in. We thank you and we praise you, Lord. Bless each and every one from Inverness right down to Lulworth and Bobbington, Tidworth and Bullford, Lucas and Cooper. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus. Bless them mightily. Now, while we start to run on a nominee, run on the thing on the name of me, Masu, give me Masu and a bar of any vinaka, sang another tiny, and then a little bit of a new chisuna, Amen and amen.